Okay, first thing we're going to do is review where we left off about the um, tip calculator in Beetle's example. And then we're going to finish it off by looking at the code that we haven't looked at. And then we are going to internationalize it by adding a different resource file. All right, so that's what's on the agenda today. And after that, I don't know what we're going to do. That should take us up to the end of the hour. If not, I don't know. Um, we'll figure something out. Okay, here's the code where we looked at last time. And um, let's see. Nothing earth shattering about the layout if memory serves. We had looked at this, and the main difference between this and the others is we, we didn't use a button. We used um, a couple of other controls that the user interacts with, namely a namely a slider, or uh, a seat bar, and a text field. So we can enter in an amount, we can slide the tip to percentage and get what we want. So there's no button to click. But still, the idea is the same. There's going to be listeners that are associated with each of those controls that listen or wait for a certain action to occur and when they occur they kick in. Those actions are, guess what? Those, those action listeners are going to be an interface. All of the action listeners, to my knowledge anyhow, are interfaces. Which means that we can create a class to implement an action listener um, and we are promised we, we promise by creating that class that implements the action listener that we are going to implement all the methods that exist in it. So we saw that before when we made our activity the on-click listener. Now in this case we have two things that we need to listen to. We have the edit text and we have the seek bar. Both of those we need to listen to. And we could have extended app compat activity and implement on seek bar change listener and implement amount or an I'm sorry and implement text watcher. We could have done that. As long as we put all of those methods in our main activity. So we would have put these three methods for the on seek listener, these three methods for the text watcher. That would be putting a lot in our activity though, and it would be confusing what belongs to what and so on. If we were to change our user interface not to have, let's say, a seek bar, but to have something else, a drop down or whatever, that would be very confusing. So rather than implementing those interfaces on the activity itself, which we could do, right? We saw it before, we did it with on click listener, we could do it with one listener, we could do it with two listeners, right? Because unlike inheritance, you can have multiple uh, interfaces implemented by a class. That's okay. In fact, that was the whole purpose, one of the whole purposes of interfaces is that you, uh, it got around the issue of multiple inheritance by extending one and allowing a class to implement a bunch of different interfaces. All right. But again, that would get to be a lot of code in the class and that would get to be a little unwieldy. So instead, they created what's called an anonymous class. Anonymous, in a nutshell, is when there's no name associated with it. There's no name for this class. It's also an inner class because its definition is contained within the definition of the other class, in this class the main activity. So it's an inner class and an anonymous class. Let's look to see how this anonymous class works. It's private first of all, which kind of makes sense, right, for an inner class. 
this code is tied. Um, I want to use a big word here, but I'm afraid I'm going to mispronounce it. Um, it's tied by the nature of the kind of class it is. It's tied to the activity. All right? No other, no other classes can access that. Object. Well, we, and, and it doesn't even make sense to think of other classes uh, accessing it. So it's, it's tied with that, all right? And therefore, it doesn't need to be public. It's final, which means that um, it can't be changed, all right? It's of type on, on seek bar, on seek bar change listener, and we give it a name. So we're declaring the type of variable it is, or the, the class, we're defining the name of the class equals new, and then we have in parentheses the class definition. But nowhere is the name of our class. All right. Interestingly enough, this is almost like a little loophole to the old thing of instantiating a interface. We're not really instantiating an interface. We're instantiating an anonymous class using the new interface and then putting between the parentheses the implementation of that interface. So it's a little deceptive where you see on seek, new on seek bar listener. I might have said in your Java 101 class that you can't instantiate an interface. And this sure looks like you're instantiating an, inter instantiating an interface, but you're not. All right? You're instantiating an anonymous class that implements that interface. So if we look here, it will tell us that this, in fact, is a public interface. All right? So that saves us the trouble of having to create a class with a name and so on and so forth. You can do that too, by the way. There's just no particular advantage to doing that in this case. Again, the whole idea of making a class is reusability, that you're going to use something over and over again. This is just code that you want for this activity. There's no sense, like with the dice class, of being able to reuse that somewhere else. If we write another activity, even if that activity is similar, it's going to have its own listeners. All right? So the methods associated with the onSeek bar listener are on progress changed, on start tracking, on stop tracking. Now, these two, we implement that method, but we don't put any code in there. All right? We have to implement it because that's the rules of an interface. An interface says when you implement that interface, you have to implement all the functions. Doesn't say you have to put any code in them, though. All right? Unless it's asking you for, to return anything. Well, if, if there was a return, we certainly would need to return something. But in this case, given it as a public void, on track, start tracking touch, on stop tracking touch, you can actually write code when they start and stop dragging it. This is the code when the progress has changed. In other words, when we've gone from one value to another. And that's what we're really interested in, when the, pro when the value of that seat bar has changed. So like that also fires like while the, while the user is moving? While the user is dragging, when the value of it changed. We're going to look a little closer, closer at the seek bar in a minute here. Okay, this function, again, automatically gets triggered. That's part of the framework. So when we drag that seek bar, the, whatever listener is associated with it, this is a function that's going to fire off. We get as an argument the seek bar that's in play. We get the progress, in other words, where it is on the progress. And we set the percent <laughs> we set the percent to be the value of the progress, which automatically gets passed to this function, all right, um, and divided by 100 to get a percent. 
we get whether it comes from user or not. I would imagine if it, that what that relates to is was it dragged or was something programmatically set the value of that. And then we call calculate. So what is percent? It's an instance variable in the activity. All right, percent. We default it to 15. So we set that percent to what we want it to be, and we call calculate. All right. We're going to ignore calculate for a second. All right. And we're going to notice what happens when we change the text. Again, everything I said for the seek bar is the same for the text watcher. Same method of creating an anonymous class. We define the methods that are associated with it. Two of the methods we ignore, all right, because we're not interested. But we are interested in the on text changed. And what we're going to do is we are going to parse the value that's in the text box. Notice what this uh, with this method gets. And again, notice that. This is, this is predefined in the framework. We don't have to do anything to wire this together. If we define this class, this anonymous class as a listener, whenever someone changes a value in a text box, this method gets called and it gets passed those arguments. Character sequence S will automatically get passed. Well, what do you suppose that is? That's the characters that are in the edit text field. Int start, int before, not sure what, the, what, what, what that is. Uh, and finally, int count, probably the number of characters. You can look up that method on, on, online and find the documentation. You absolutely can. I'm just not interested in that right at this moment. Yeah, I don't think we'll, we'll be needing that. So. Well, again, you might. It depends I mean, on your problem. I mean, right. yeah, I mean, not interested. In this particular case, we're not interested. We put this in a try catch, all right? The try catch tries to parse it as a double, all right, the bill amount, takes the characters in there, divides by 100, and gives you a bill amount, all right? Then sets the text view for the bill amount, formatted as currency, all right? If you notice, we're typing in the text view a value is actually automatically adding the two decimal points on. That's what the, the divide by 100 does. All right? And it sets it in the text view. The text view, again, if we look in layout, sort of overlaps over the edit text field. All right? This just allows you know, them not to have to put the decimal point in and all that. It automatically does that for them. We then if it's there's an exception, we set things to zero and we clear that clear it out. And then we call calculate. So if either the percent changed or the number for the amount of the meal changed. In both cases, we end up calling calculate. Now, we define the edit text to be numeric, right, to accept a number. And we even said the only numbers that we're allowed to enter, the only values that we're allowed to enter, are 0 through 9. All right, edit text. Input type. Pardon me? Right. You would remove your digits. And I removed the digits, that's right. I must, I must have saved it with it removed. I was confused because I didn't see the digits. All right. These two things, again, kind of lay on top of each other. You enter it in, and it gets formatted and put in the text view. Um, that's probably why, since the decimal point is automatically calculated, that's probably why they didn't have the decimal point as an allowed value in there. All right? I think there is one. Repeat that, please. I think there is an input type that allows decimal points. I just, I just don't remember the name. 
Well, yeah, I mean, that's what the digits did, is eliminated uh, 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 entry of that. At any rate, in either case, it's going to call that. Now, question. According to this, we can only enter a number. Why, then, do we need a try catch here? Could we get away without a try catch? Does it give us a compile error? No, nope, sure doesn't look like it. Why put a try catch in there? We've already defined that as being numeric, right? Yeah, we have a try catch to take the value of it and parse it to a double. There's still a possibility that it, there could be like, to like just letters in there. Like maybe it's not the user, maybe it's not always the user's fault that they put it in there. It's just like it just happens to be there. Okay. Um, I think you're sort of moving in the right direction. Does anyone want to add to that? In my opinion, this is a case of like someone that wears a pair, wears a belt and a pair of suspenders, right? This is just being absolutely sure. It's good practice if you parse a string to a double that is wrapped in a try catch. Now, I know that the user interface doesn't prevent or doesn't allow the enter of something non-numeric in there. Guess what? Someone could correctly or incorrectly change the interface to do something else, mess it up after I've gone. If I have to try catch there, I'm covered though. So it's just good programming practice. You know that that instruction could go wrong if somehow that got it in there. Uh, a, a string, uh, uh, an alphanumeric character, not a number got into that field. So you might as well try catch. How long does it take to do that? That really makes your program just that much tighter and that less prone to problem if someone goes back and makes a change to, uh, to mess it up. All right? Because if, if it tries to parse uh, um, a number but it isn't really a number, it, it, it could crash the entire app. It would throw an exception and it would crash the app, exactly. So you might as well take the extra two minutes. You know how a try-catch works. You know that there's a potential. Even though this one shouldn't allow it, you test for it anyhow. You know, I've seen that code like that all kinds of places. You know, it, it may seem redundant, but it's good programming practice just in case. Later on, a change is made to the code that would let something slip by. For example, if you're dividing by two numbers, you should always, if, if they're variables, if they're coming from somewhere, always check for a divide by zero. All right? Because, again, how long does it take to do that, to, to put a test in? All right? And it can save, again, having the, the application crash. And if, you're, if you want some more like general cache, like this one's just a number format exception, but in the case of like, if you're also dividing by a variable that could be zero, you can also just do a catch with like a, with just exception, and it will catch all, catch all the exceptions that will be thrown. Correct. Again, it would, it would be based on the particular problem that you're trying to solve. Okay, in either case, notice what we have here. Bill amount and percent are two instance variables. And our two methods here set those values. The seek bar sets the value of the percent. The text watcher sets the value of the bill amount. So, that's something you can do with an inner class, right? That's another idea uh, of an inner class. Something's defined as an inner class, it can, it, it has access to all the instance variables of its parent class. So, because this was defined as an inner class, the code in here can manipulate these guys. All right? Notice that there's not a lot of code in the listener, all right? That's sort of a good programming practice as well. All these listeners do is grab the appropriate value, whether it be from the seek bar or from the text box, set an instance variable, and then call calculate, all right? 
that's sort of a good programming practice, that there's not a lot of code in the listener. The listener grabs the inputs, then dispatches someone else to finish the job. And that's exactly what Calculate does. Calculate, first of all, is going to go and it's going to set the percentage text view, the percent text view, with whatever value I've chosen using the seek bar. So notice that the seek bar is just this line, literally. As I move it back and forth, I'm changing the percentage from a maximum of 30 to a minimum of zero. That text, that, that, that value here is actually a separate um, text view. And this code here in Calculate, which gets called both the times, both when the seek bar changes and when the edit text field changes, we're going to refresh that percentage in the text box just in case a percentage changed. We can more or less prove that to ourselves by looking. Here is the text view for the percentage. Here is the seek bar. The seek bar, again, we looked at it last time, but just to review, the maximum is 30, so it goes from 0 to 30. The progress uh, initially is initialized to 15. We're not going to worry about these layout gravity things right away. All right, we'll, we'll come and we'll talk about layout stuff um, later on. Okay, so what else does Calculate do? Calculate, after it does that, it's going to calculate the tip by multiplying the bill amount times the percentage. All right, it's going to calculate the total by taking the bill amount and adding it to the tip. What is the bill amount? Well, again, it's an instance variable. It gets set on the, by the listener on the on text change event. We then format the two answer areas to plug in the tip and the total amount. So each example that we go over, I think, takes what we've done before and adds a little bit to it. All right? What this one did, um, from before, uh, compared to before, is it created the listeners differently. Again, could we have created the listeners the same way? Yes. It didn't really make sense in this case, though, because we have two listeners in play here, and it would be confusing if we had one class implementing both the listeners. We could do it, but it might make for some confusing code. So we removed that confusion by creating two anonymous classes to do the listening. We assign those listeners as the listener to the edit text field and to the seek bar. Each of them, when the thing changes, we set the instance variables that are needed for the calculation, then perform the calculate method. We ignore some of the methods in the interface simply because we're not interested in that particular behavior. We only want to recalculate when the value has changed, not when we've started dragging. Subtle difference, but it's really what we need to do, all, all we need to do. Questions about this? I have a question about the activity main.xml for the edit text mm -hmm. view. Um, is there anything else in Android that you need to implement to get the member pad to show up? Should just be the input input type. I have a question for you. Okay, because if you notice, we do that. We then go to that, and when we're in that field, we have the number pad showing up. That made it disappear. We go back in there. When that has focus, it appears again. I made it disappear by clicking this. When it gets focused, it gets this. And maybe this will answer your question. Notice that um, never mind. I thought there was code in here that, that gave it focus, but there isn't. 
by virtue of it being the first view, it probably has focus that way. So that's when we, the application runs, it, it goes in there initially. They're doing it just a wee bit differently. Notice that what we've done is we've done something like this, where we've said edit text, amount edit text equals edit text, find view by ID. So we've defined that variable and then found the view that corresponds to that variable and casted it. Here the definition is up here. Our amount text view is, is an instance variable. So it's available throughout the application, all right, throughout this class. Because if you notice, we're going to refer to that, or at least the person that wrote this figured that we, we might refer to that, like we refer to the tip text view, for example. That might be a better example. We refer to that um, here in the on create and we refer to it in the calculate method. So it's made an instance variable so that it can be viewed throughout the class. So the only difference between this is we've declared it as an instance variable and then we find it and cast it here. So it's your, your good observation is a little teeny bit different. No, what that what this does again, variables have have a scope, right? When you declare a variable, where you declare it matters. So, notice this amount edit text. All right, we've declared that variable inside the onCreate method. That's the only place it's available. Is on the um, on the, uh, uh, in the onCreate event. This variable, however, bill amount, percent, tip text view, total text view, we declared those just as an instance variable in the class. So they're not part of any method. When you declare something not part of a method, but just as part of the class, then it's called an instance variable because it could be, it, it, there's one of these per class and it can be accessed anywhere throughout the class. So the, the, the answer to that is this allowed us to declare these variables and access them wherever we wanted to inside the class. Whereas this guy here, we only need to access the edit text so that we can assign a listener to it. Once we've assigned a listener to it, we don't need that variable anymore. All right, so we declare it there. It's a little goofy the way they do it, but I mean, it makes sense and it works. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? goes out of scope, but the object itself, because it's part of the content view, is still alive. So it is, it is part of the content view. It's part of the content view. So that object. But if you did, but, but if you did like a, like a intermediate calculation or something like that, like an object, and then it's going out of scope. Well, you're not creating an object. You're creating an object reference. Okay. Because this doesn't create an object. This finds an existing object that lives as part of the... Right. You're just pointing to it. You're just pointing to it. Okay. So this pointer goes out of scope, right. okay. all right, but the object itself doesn't. Right. Yeah. All right. Whereas if you like, make like, so like, for example, an intermediate calculation and with, as a variable with just an end method, once, um, once that, once you understand that method, then that, that variable will go into the garbage collector, right? 
you'd have to know more about the program itself to answer that. If there were no, if there was If there's nothing pointing to the object, it will it will get garbage collected. If there's something else pointing to the object, it will not get garbage collected. Okay. It's a little inconsistent how they do that, but it works. And as long as we understand it, um, I think that's important. Notice that the other thing that's a little weird that I don't really like is how they put they, I don't know. They put these class definitions at the end. Because this is also an instance variable, the seek bar listener. I would prefer to put it up here with the rest of the instance variables. But again, it works. So that's just a personal preference. It can be all these methods or variables can be in any order and they'll still work. Okay. All right, so internationalizing this. Let's say we wanted to make a French version of this, okay? Again, that's handled through what's called a resource qualifier. I'll probably go over this a bunch of times, all right, um, as we study different reasons to do resource qualifiers, all right? Again, we had talked about the whole reason for putting strings in the string file, or we can ensure consistency throughout our application. Now, in our case, we only have one activity, one UI. Um, but again, if you had multiple UIs, and you called it tip and total on a variety of screens, okay? Maybe, for example, I don't know, I'm just thinking of stupid examples, but maybe you would have a breakfast tip calculator, a lunch tip calculator, and a dinner tip calculator. I don't know why you would, but maybe you would. All right. Each one of those could be its own activity. An activity essentially is a screen that you present to the user for them to fill in and do something. If we would want consistency among those, like we would want to call tip, tip on every screen, all right, we could do that by simply pointing to this. If we wanted to change it to tip amount, we could change it in the XML file, and every screen that referred to tip would get the change, right? So that's one of the reasons we put these strings in an XML file. Another reason we do is we can, under certain circumstances, ask for a different resource file to be used, all right? And notice that this is called strings. So that's the default strings file, and we have colors, we have a couple dimensions, we have styles. Here we have activity main.xml. We can specify for any of those resources what are called resource qualifiers. A resource qualifier says, under these conditions, use this file instead. So the default is strings, but we could use a different string file based on any number of factors. The most obvious one would be language, right? Uh, in, uh, you know, if we want to make a French version of this application, would create uh, a strings file that is set to apply when the language equals French, all right? Or Spanish or whatever. But we could also do that if the screen size is bigger, right? If the screen size is bigger, maybe we want our labels to be more verbose. Whereas if we're on a small screen, we want to have short, abbreviated labels, all right? So we could create a different string file for any number of reasons, all right? And if we look up Android resource qualifiers, we'll see a whole list of the things that we could do. country code from the SIM card. 
the language and region, the layout direction. For example, some languages, right, the language, the language, the, the letters are written in a different order, a different sequence, instead of right to left, left to right. You could rearrange your screen and have a resource qualifier if it's from left to right. Smallest width of the screen, and so on down the line. Screen size, normal, large, extra large. We could create a string file for extra large screens where every screen description was a long, verbose tip them out. Remember to tip your wait staff because they depend on this to make a living. You know, we could write very long labels in there, and so on. We could even do things like combine these. If, it's, if the language is French and it's a large screen, do this, all right? We're just gonna do a simple example though. Of we're gonna say, I wanna create a new values file. So I click on my values and right mouse or alternate mouse if you're on a Mac and say I wanna create a new values resource file. And what is the file name? The file name is strings. And it's in the directory values, and I want it to be based on locale. Now I notice here that I can like drag over these. This is where I could do French on a large screen. I'm only going to do French though. So I'm going to go down to French. And I can choose French in different areas. I believe these are the regions that where French is, is spoken. So we could say if you're, if you're a French speaker in Belgium, have a different set of labels because there might be a slightly different dialect, you know. People that speak Spanish say that people in Spain use different words, words and phrases and someone in Mexico might use it different than Cuba and so on. But in this case, we're not going to get that advanced. We're just going to say for French, we want a resource qualifier and I'll click OK. So that'll create my XML file. What I'm going to do, simply in the interest of time, is I'm going to copy everything over. And I'm going to override those here. And just in the name of accuracy, I'm going to go into Google Translate to translate these into French so I'm not just putting le in front of everything, like I have done in some uh, classes. Okay, so I want to go from English to French. So, tip calculator. is this. I took two years of high school French, which is many years ago, and I don't feel comfortable trying to pronounce that. Calculatrice de pourbois, I would think it would be. Edit them out. I'm trusting that these are correct. If it ends up that I'm actually cursing in French and anyone watches this video on YouTube, please don't take offense. Just email me and blame Google. Tip percentage, 15% is 15%. Now you might look and say, well, 15%. Well, you know, um, 
I think the percent sign is universal, but you know, some places do use a comma for decimal. So like if you had a decimal point um, in something, you might change it just um, for something um, if that had that, if you're internationalizing it. Tip. I have a feeling I might be translating it wrong. Yeah, because I actually want that. Because tip means point, or it means like the tip that you give someone. And then finally, total. Translates to total. So we don't have to do anything here. So when we run this, we're going to have to go in and change the device to be a French language device. So we go here and run this. It's going to come up initially with the English uh, version of it because that's what our device is initialized as. So I'm going to go here, click on settings, which is a little gear thingy, and I'll go down to system. Shoot. I had such a hard time doing this earlier when I was reviewing this. Language and input. Language. You can add a language. I can do a search. I can pick French. All regions. Oh. I think it's. I think it's more like um, specify like like. Are you talking about Canadian, um, Canada French, or, or right. France French? Right. And I I know what it is. just drag these around and order them. Because really, if you think about it, um, let's say I was someone that lived, I'm trying to think, Switzerland, let's say. What language do they speak in Switzerland? <laughs> Pardon me? Yeah, they speak more than one, right? That's why I deliberately pick Swiss. All right. I think I think some people in Swiss. I think certain areas of Switzerland is mainly French. Certain areas are German, and probably a lot of people speak English. So if you were, isn't Switzerland like? I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> isn't Switzerland like surrounded by many different countries with many different languages? Yes, they are. So many people in Switzerland speak uh, French. Many people speak German, and many people speak uh, English. So. If I was living in Switzerland, depending on what my language preferences are, I could actually set up a preference to go in. Because there might not be a German file, for example, if German was my first language, but okay, I'll take it in French. All right? Um, and there probably always will be a default uh, English file. I can also then get rid of things that I don't want. So I can delete English completely off the list. All right, now I go back to this, and notice what I got. I got my application, but I didn't have to make any coding changes, and it reads a new XML. And up here is the phrase that says, from, from the string file, modify, and so on and so on. Now, one thing I want to do, I want to test this for my own case. What if I don't have everything in there? Like, for example, totals the same in both. All right? Maybe I want to only over override a certain number of fields. I'll bet it will refer back to the original strings to grab that. So let's test that out. No. And 
and depending on the device that you're running, that can be nice because sometimes it takes a while to fire it up. All right. Now, it's also what it did. It changed the dollar amount, the currency amount, to euros because in our code, somewhere down here, ah, currency format. That will that's localized, so it will use the format of whatever um, whatever is the, the currency format for that region. Pretty cool. Nice thing is it didn't require any coding, all right. And you just swap out XML files, and they sort of cascade down. Like um, if you didn't want to define everything for a different language, you could pick just a handful of things to define and, and let the rest default to, let the rest go to the defaults. Did, so I, I guess I missed that, so it did pick up the... It did pick it up. Just like 15% is 15%, so I don't need that in there. And maybe my app name, you know, Twitter is probably Twitter, regardless of the language, uh, you know. Maybe I don't need an international version of the app name, so I can remove that. I can just override the ones that I want to override, it seems to be. And now when I run this, still says tip calculator up there. But for the things that are different, it took them. Um, the things that aren't in the French file, it got it from the. So it's almost like cascading style sheets in that you only override the things that you want to be different. You don't have to put everything in. Now, um, what was I going to say about this? Um, I'm going to prank myself by not changing this back to English. So when I run this on Tuesday, um, maybe I'll be in for a rude awakening or something, and, and, and I hope I can rem I hope I can read enough French to set the settings back to English. All right, yeah, we'll see. I think yeah, because I mean when it changes, it changes everything. So like I go to settings. Okay. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, shoot, I have a little hard time scrolling with this. I think here, system, language, and all that. So I hope I will be able to change it. If not, it will be a hard learn lesson. All right, uh, that's all I had for today. Uh, we'll see you over in lab. Running it, running it saves everything, oh, okay. and yeah. Still getting used to it. Yeah. Okay, what am I doing?